This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by my co-host Juan Gonzalez from his home in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, the official death toll from COVID-19 in the United States is just hitting 200,000, though the real number is almost certainly far higher. Some public health experts say infections could spike this fall and winter and double the death count by the end of the year. As the virus continues to spread, we look now at allegations that immigration and customs enforcement help spread the virus through medical neglect and abuse in ICE jails. On Monday, ICE confirmed the 20th person to die in its detention in fiscal year 2020, making it one of the deadliest periods in the agency's history. Cipriano Chavez Alvarez was a 61-year-old Mexican immigrant who'd been held at the Stewart Detention Center in Lumpkin, Georgia, and died in a nearby hospital. His passing marks the third COVID-19 fatality at that jail and the eighth known COVID death in ICE custody. ICE says nearly 5,700 prisoners nationwide have been infected with COVID. This comes as an explosive complaint filed on behalf of a whistleblower nurse, a accuses a different ICE jail in Georgia, the Irwin County Detention Center, of failing to protect both prisoners and employees from the virus. The whistleblower, <clears throat> Dawn Wooten, a nurse, was a nurse at the jail. She said it failed to adhere to coronavirus safety protocols. She also alleges a large number of unwanted hysterectomies have been performed on prisoners by a local doctor known as the uterus collector. The complaint does not name a specific staff, staff doctor, but lawyers for several people detained there have told De Tina Vasquez at Prism and other news outlets, including The New York Times, that he's an obstetrics and gynecology specialist named Mahendra Amin, who has an office in the city of Douglas near the ICE jail. It's been reported that Amin and other doctors previously paid half a million dollars in a settlement of a civil federal Medicare fraud allegation. The Intercept reported that three prisoners said Amin had performed at least 20 hysterectomies over six years. One said while Amin was excising a cyst from her ovary, he removed part of a fallopian tube without her consent. Amin told The Intercept that, quote, everything is wrong about the complaint. I said in a statement that only two prisoners at Irwin County had undergone hysterectomies since 2018 and has not confirmed how many other potentially sterilizing surgeries were done, such as tubal ligations. Dawn Wooten will join us in a minute to describe what she saw. She spoke out after nine women detained in Irwin managed to film and have uploaded to YouTube in April. The women wore makeshift masks and held signs that said, there are sick people here, we are not criminals, and please help. One by one, they came forward to tell their stories. I work in intake. I see the people who enter. I see how the guards work. All I saw is that they ask people to leave when they enter, men, women, whoever. They don't attend to them. They don't ask them the necessary questions to diagnose them. We are at risk. They don't give us anything to cover ourselves so that we can protect ourselves. I was the first person that got sick. I went to the clinic and that it lasted no more than five minutes. They didn't give me necessary resources. They simply told me, you're fine, go back to your cell. We need protection, please. All we want is for people to listen to their conscience, their hearts. Because we are so many mothers in this place who are suffering so much, so many humiliations for the love of God. Why can't ICE understand? Why do we have to wait more than a year to get a court date? That was April. On Monday, Democrats on the House Homeland Security Committee issued a report that concluded immigrants in ICE jails systematically receive inadequate medical, dental and mental health care and face solitary confinement as a punishment for speaking out. As coronavirus cases continue to surge inside ICE prisons, the report notes, quote, the spread of COVID-19 has further highlighted how the failures to meet these standards of care are a matter of life and death. This comes as at least 
160 Democratic members of Congress sent a letter to the inspector general demanding an investigation into the reports a doctor in Georgia was performing hysterectomies on immigrant women at Irwin without their consent. This is Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey speaking Monday about whistleblower Don Wooten's allegations. My heart has been broken by some of the things that I've read uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. I'm definitely um, uh, uh, very concerned about what we heard from the uh, whistleblower Don Wooten about the barbaric treatment of detainees at Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia. And if that if these allegations are true, this is really probably one of the most inhumane things I have heard uh, coming out of an administration that I think has very little uh, low uh, bottom to its low. All of this comes as ICE has now temporarily halted the deportation of Pauline Bynum, a Cameroonian mother who says she was involuntarily sterilized while detained in Georgia. Bynum uh, Binham was already on the plane Wednesday when her deportation was stopped. She's lived in the United States since the age of two. For more, we're joined in Atlanta by Dawn Wooten, the licensed practical nurse who filed this widely discussed whistleblower complaint to the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General about abuses at the privately run Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia. Also with us in Atlanta, Azadeh Shashahani, uh, legal and advocacy director at Project South, which helped file the complaint. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Dawn Wooten, let's begin with you on this issue of forced sterilization of hysterectomies um, that is included in this complaint. Um, can you explain what the women mean when they talk about a uterus collector? I've had several women to come to me over the course of time. And in my last attendance there at Irwin County Detention Center, I had a couple of women to come to me and say, you know, every time we go out or every time we go to this place and talking with other detained women there, that they had this in common. They would talk about him being the uterus collector. And in hearing it, you know, you don't know what to say or how to respond. But that was the term that they had given um, at the time was that he's the uterus collector. Her actual question was, what does he do? What does he go around collecting everybody's uterus? You know, it's, it's jaw dropping. There's really not a response to give them for that terminology, but that's the terminology that was given to me. And Dawn, how many of these women were you able to talk to directly, and or were some of them giving you the secondhand information that they had heard from other women in the in the center? Yes, they they become family whenever they cohabitate together. They build what they call families inside of the dormitories, and they share experiences and they share life stories there, and they become really close. So in, in coming into, in hearing, you know, they had devised that term, the uterus collector. And you've also, you've also raised uh, uh, in, your, in your complaint uh, uh, the, uh, the si situation in terms of the treatment of detainees in general uh, about, uh, in re reference to COVID. Could you talk about the direct experiences that you had with how the facility was dealing with COVID patients? Yes, in March, whenever we first um, come across um, COVID-19, the first case that was there was not a case. You know, it was like it was invincible. It was a silence. You know, we were not to share it with other employees. We were not to share it with um, outside. We were not to share it amongst ourselves. There were was a time to where I was told that you don't inform the officers that this person is COVID positive. You know, in the beginning, they didn't take wearing masks seriously. We didn't have proper PPE in the beginning. It was like a cover-up. It never existed. 
And as time progressed inside of the facility and there were more cases that systemically appeared, we were still at a place there to where it was unbelievable. We didn't have it. Don't you talk about it. Don't you discuss it. That's not true. I am a mother with an underlying condition. I have kids that have underlying conditions. And once the terms came to, hey, there's COVID-19 inside of this facility, they were not reporting to the health department. They were not reporting to the CDC. So there were cases in the beginning that were not accounted for. They were not justified. And I became in fear, not just for myself, but for the lives of others that were around me, as well as my children. We had N95s. I received one in March. I asked for one again in May, and I was told that you're going to have to put this in a bag. You were given one in March. And until July the 2nd, um, last day at the facility, I still had to receive a N95 that I knew was in the building. And I had it detaining to someone stopped me in the hall and said, can you check this man's temp? I went to check the detainee's temp. It was 101.8. I went and I concurred with my supervisor. And one nurse said that she checked it was 97.3. You know, going back to check it a second time, it's 101.8. He had a valid temp. I was told that they wrapped themselves in cover. It has to depend on what time of day hand them some ibuprofen. That's not professional nursing. That is not something that I can do. He was not tested. You have several detainees that will come up and they will be symptomatic. But I was told that everybody reads the news, everybody sees the news. They know how to present the symptoms coming across the news. It was inhumane and it was not justifiably correct. I live by you treat people how you want to be treated. You don't treat people as if they don't exist and they were ignored. The sanitation, we didn't have anything to sanitize with. There was no hand sanitizer. We were not wiping down six feet distance. There was not six feet distance. We're all a couple of nurses in a room and not only were detainees positive, but there were also employees positive. It wasn't taken seriously. And I fear for my life and the lives of those that I'm around. You, you yourself, Don Wooten, uh, suffer from sickle cell. Um, you voiced your complaints about the lack of protection for staff, like you, a nurse, as well as the prisoners. Um, can you talk about whether or not you think that was related to your demotion? I do. Um, I have sickle cell. I had to have a my new procedure. And when I took it to my supervisor, I was told, even though you're going to be COVID tested, you can still come to work, wear a mask. I was symptomatic. I went to the physician earlier on in this COVID case at Urban County Detention Center. I was diagnosed with an upper respiratory infection. I had fluid on my lung. I was taking inhalation or breathing treatments. I was on antibiotics. I was running a temp. I had diarrhea. I had headaches. I had chest pain, I had a cough, a raspy cough. I was told I still could present to work because my test confirmed that I was negative, but I was symptomatic. I wanted to bring um, Azadeh Shashahani into the conversation, uh, because we just reported that another person has died in an ICE prison, uh, not at Irwin, where uh, Nurse Wooten worked. Um, but um, in a separate facility. And I was wondering if you can tell us the latest news on him. Sure, Amy. Thank you very much for having me. First, I wanted to say that, as Project South, we're part of a movement that believes that systematic state violence is not to be tolerated in any form. So whether it's ICE caging and harming immigrants or cops murdering black people in the streets with impunity. And we are truly honored as Project South to be representing Ms. Wooten along with the Government Accountability Project. She's truly a hero um, for telling us about um, these outrageous conduct on the behalf of on behalf of the facility. So, you know, we don't really know very much about um, the death of Cipriano Chavez Alvarez, a 61-year-old man. Um, he was a Mexican national. As far as I know, ICE has not even issued a press statement at this point. 
But what we, knew, what we do know is that this marks the third death at the Stuart Detention Center, also a corporate run facility, during the pandemic. Um, so three men have already died of COVID-19 or complications related to COVID-19. And two of them were elderly, um, including Mr. Cipriano Chavez Alvarez and the other one, Santiago Button Oxlash, was a 34-year-old man who had diabetes. So the question is, why would ICE continue to hold people who are elderly or have pre-existing conditions in a facility that we already know is a deadly one? You know, seven people have died at the Stewart Detention Center just in the past three years, two of them by suicide after being placed in solitary for prolonged periods of time. So, you know, those of us on the ground who have called for this facility, Stuart, as well as Irving, to be shut down for a long time, the question that we have is what else would it take for decision makers to finally move and do something about this before we see additional tragedies at these facilities? Well, uh, as a day, we played at the beginning of this segment a clip of some women uh, at the facility uh, talking about the uh, the conditions in uh, in back in April. Could you talk about the context of that and what happened to those women after this uh, this uh, uh, this video got out? Sure. So instead of addressing their concerns and actually taking care of the people inside to make sure that the you know, this deadly disease does not spread, the facility run by a private corporation, La Salle, proceeded to retaliate against all the women who were involved in the making of that video in any way. So they placed them in solitary confinement for a number of days, and that led to extreme emotional and mental health damage for all of them. And one of the uh, most uh, uh, egregious points raised in the complaint of Dawn Wooten is this whole issue of whether there had been sterilizations of women occurring at Irwin without their consent. Could you talk about what your organization knows about this and to how extensive it is? Sure. So, you know, thanks to uh, Ms. Dawn Wooten and, and her courage in coming out about all of this and, you know, the documentation and the complaint that we were able to release, um, that has really opened the door to a lot of lawyers coming forward, um, a lot of immigrants coming forward. Um, you know, we are um, in touch with lawyers, you know, trying to track down women all over the world who have been at this facility and have suffered some type of violation to their body. I mean, it is truly egregious that immigrant women at a truly vulnerable situation at this facility, at the mercy of ICE and the LaSalle Corporation, were treated in this fashion. Um, and so, you know, what we do know is that there were hysterectomies, um, there were other procedures that were done on, on women without their consent. And I would like to address ICE's um, response in terms of, um, you know, the number of hysterectomies. First of all, what they said is that they know of only two people being referred for hysterectomies. Um, you know, part of, um, you know, part of what um, we're saying is that, uh, you know, based on what we know about um, what was happening and what this doctor was doing, um, people may have been referred for something else, you know, a minor issue like what happened with Pauline uh, Binham, you know, she went in for a minor um, issue and then the next thing she knew her fallopian tube was taken out that that led to a sterilization. So, you know, the question is what happened at the doctor's office in terms of the procedures? And secondly, you know, those of us who have been doing immigrant rights work for a long time know that ICE has no moral credibility whatsoever. Um, and anything that they say should be taken with a grain of salt. And also, um, you know, there are assertions about shredding of medical um, information at this facility. And so that also shines, um, you know, a doubt on what ICE is um, asserting here. And lastly, they are themselves saying that they haven't been able to determine um, the true number of uh, gynecological procedures that were done on women. So, you know, that is why we issued the complaint. There is absolutely a need for an independent and thorough investigation by the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General and by Congress, and we need to shut this place down.
So, <clears throat> we reported earlier Tina Vasquez at PRISM and other outlets, including The New York Times, um, uh, say that uh, the doctor is an obstetrics and gynecology specialist named Mahendra Mean, who has an office in the city of Douglas near the ICE jail. It's been reported that he and other doctors previously paid half a million dollars in a settlement of a civil, civil federal Medicare fraud allegation years ago. Um, what do you know about him? You have ICE, um, uh, Dr. Ada Rivera, the medical director of ICE Health Services Corporation, uh, saying the reports would be investigated, but that the agency, quote, vehemently disputes the implication that detainees are used for experimental medical procedures. What do you know about D Dr. Mahendra Amin in particular? And overall, is are more doctors involved, Azadeh? So, what the media has reported about um, Dr. Amin, and I should clarify that um, Project South, the Government Accountability Project, and our client, Ms. Wooten, um, are not able to confirm the identity of the doctor. But what the media has reported about Dr. Amin is that um, this person was not even board certified, which, um, you know, raises the question about, um, you know, the level of care that um, ICE has for the people in its custody that they would send people over a number of years to a physician who was not even board certified. Um, and what the media has reported is that, you know, in addition to the, um, to the settlement that you, um, that you mentioned um, with the Department of Justice, um, uh, Dr. Amin was also involved in um, a series of lawsuits. Um, so that all, you know, remains to be investigated. Um, you know, we do not know for sure at this point whether there were other physicians involved, you know, in terms of what was happening at the facility, in terms of referring people to him. You know, that all needs to be investigated. And again, that is why we um, filed is, the report. Is he still operating at the jail? Um, from what we know, they have stopped referring people to um, Dr. Amin, but that happened very, very late in the game. Don Wooten, I know you have to leave, and we so appreciate you taking this time. Do you fear for your own safety as you speak out? And what happens to those inside the prison, the immigrant women who speak out? Sa safety is um, an issue. Um, having gotten any, you know, wild threats or anybody saying, you know, that, hey, we're going to come after you. But at the same time, it's the issue. Because any time that you hold morally and ethically and you do what's right and correct, um, you have to realize that now I've become a target. Um, the voice and the ladies that are there at the facility. Yes, I empathize with those ladies that are speaking out at the facility because we live in the real world and we process things, you know, in the real world differently. So there is, as women, we're supposed to remain silent according to the world and we're not supposed to have a voice. So in speaking out, um, I am concerned for them and for um, how they're going to be treated and isolated. Yeah, I'd also like to ask uh, Azadeh Shashashani. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't realize still, unfortunately, that the people held in detention, in, uh, in ICE detention, that this is, uh, are largely there on civil uh, issues and are awaiting uh, hearings in their cases. They are not uh, criminals, yet they are treated uh, in large part by the the government's uh, detention uh, uh, centers as criminals well i mean i should you know i should say that obviously regardless of what offense a person may have been accused of or not um, in this really corrupt um, criminal legal process obviously everybody is entitled to human rights fundamental human rights and we should be fighting for everybody's human dignity um, the same uh, it is true that these facilities are civil detention centers, and the people held in these facilities, um, many of them are awaiting deportation proceedings, or they may be asylum seekers, you know, they may be afraid of torture in their home countries, and that is why they uh, fled to the U.S. to try to find refuge in this country. And instead, 
um, you know, the U.S. government places them in these horrid places where, you know, they are denied basic uh, human rights in terms of medical care, clean water, um, you know, good food, edible food. And when they complain, the U.S. government and the private prison corporations retaliate against them by, you know, using tear gas in some cases, placing them in solitary confinement and trying to basically, um, you know, shut down their voices. And the significance of now the House calling for an investigation into all of this? I mean, you had uh, Houston Congress member Sheila Jackson Lee. You have Pramila Jayapal, before she was a Congress member, major immigrant rights activist in Seattle, leading this charge and getting 160 Congress members to sign on, which led to Pauline Binham being taken off the plane as it was about to take off in Chicago. Um, what do you want to see come out of this investigation? Yeah, that is huge, you know, especially, um, again, those of us on the ground have been calling for a number of years on Congress to act, um, and they did not, even after people started dying at Stewart. Um, they didn't do anything significant. And then, you know, as a result of the national outrage um, last week, we are glad that finally Congress is paying attention. We have been contacted by multiple congressional staffers um, about the complaint. And so, you know, we do hope that um, there is continued pressure on the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General to ensure that they conduct a thorough and independent investigation into violations at the facility. And, you know, um, there's been a lot of attention on, um, you know, the, the evils that the doctor did. But you know, the problem goes beyond this one doctor. These were people in the custody of the U.S. government. You know, at the end of the day, the buck stops with ICE and with the U.S. government. And so they need to be held accountable as well as, as, well as the private prison corporation. And what we are demanding is that the facility be shut down. Azadeh Shashahani, I want to thank you so much for being with us, Legal and Advocacy Director at Project South. And Dawn Wooten, thanks so much for joining us, licensed practical nurse who filed a whistleblower complaint about the abuses at the Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia. We will continue to cover this issue. When we come back, we'll look at Belly of the Beast, a new documentary on California's dark history of forced sterilizations inside women's prisons. Stay with us.